Hi guys, it's Lisa Unger, and I'm here again with another episode. I guess we're calling them episodes now, which seems silly, but here we are anyway with three good things. And I'm super excited um, to be here with the amazing, best-selling, award-winning uh, Hank Philippi Ryan, who is just one of my one of my besties, one of my favorite people. Hi, Hank. Hi, oh, sweetheart. I think it's an episode. It's always an episode right. with you, right? There There's always something <laughs> exciting and wonderful There's and new always. and different. Exactly. There's always some kind of an episode going on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we, we rely on it. We rely on it. Um, and Hank's most recent book uh, is a standalone called The First to Lie, and it's one of one of my favorite books of the year, and uh, it's, there it is. Oh, I have one too. Of course I do. Oh, there it is. It's gorgeous. Um, and, you know, it's just such a twisty, engaging thriller, you know, sort of a rip from the headlines, you strong female lead, you know, touching on all of my, some of my favorite topics, you know, particularly revenge. I always do love it. <laughs> I always well, love know, revenge. There was, a, there, was a, there was a thing on Twitter that said, talk about your book, tell about your book in four words. Oh, right. So I said, betrayal, motherhood, obsession, and revenge. And that's exactly what the first to lie is about. And those are all good things. Those are all good things. Those you can never go wrong with betrayal and revenge and obsession, right? Right. <laughs> so, um, Hank, you may know that I've been doing three good things since we, you know, since we were all kind of on lockdown and the pandemic. And, you know, it's been kind of a dark time. It's been an incredibly dark time for many, many people. And so this was, you know, sort of my way to counteract some of that negativity. Because whenever you open up your computer, you go on and it's just, you know, bad news all the time. So this was my way of, you know, sort of connecting with my pals who, you know, even though we don't live in the same place, we would see each other, you know, many times a year, you know, as many, many times a year as we could. And, you know, and also make connections with authors. And so I've started to do this virtually for myself, selfishly, and also for my, my reader pals who have been really loving, you know, being able to hang out and talk about three good things. You know, it's interesting because I thought, you know, when the pandemic started and we had no idea what was going to happen, we still don't have any idea. And I thought, well, all right, this is hideous. This is horrible. This is apocalyptic. But I, I'm going to sit here at this very desk in my very office in Boston, and I'm just going to write and I'm just going to do this. And my husband is a lawyer, criminal defense attorney, and he's out working in the sunroom on his computer and we'll be together and we'll be home and we're lucky and safe. So count your blessings about that. So I sat down at this computer to write my 13th book and I thought, oh, I don't know what I, I don't know how to do this anymore. I don't know how to write a book and what does it even matter and why am I doing this? Um, and it was very difficult and I have a book diary that I keep every day. And I looked back on it, um, you know, as the pandemic started and it, I, I had written, you know, I have no idea. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know how to do this. And as the time went by, and I wonder if you, you know, I, I felt that there was this sort of veneer of terror over mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I better buy light bulbs. You know, I better go get more aluminum foil. You know, I, I, I need to, what if, what if there's not enough things here? Um, and there's this terror and short attention span. And what I started doing was rationing the news. You know, I've been a television reporter for 43 years, so rationing the news is not what I do. But that, you know, constant, constant influx of terror and negativity and fear, I mean, that it affects you. Did, exactly. did that happen to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that was, you know, sort of one of the reasons why I started doing this. Um, and also, it, but that is part of a big talk that I've been giving on creativity and chaos, which is, you know, so for me, create, you know, the, the page, you know, my writing, that's like my escape hatch. It's the place mm -hmm. where I go to move away from negativity, right? It's where I metabolize you know, the chaos that I perceive in the world. So for me, that it's, 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 it's always been that in even the darkest times in my life, personally, that's where I have gone. So 
Um, but I do talk about this quite a bit in, in, in my talks about creativity that, you know, in fact, you, you do have to ration your exposure to the news and to social media and you should be at your desk at the page way before any of that stuff even you even even open the window or open the door to allow that in you have that ability to go straight to the page and to not you know sip from that toxic sludge <laughs> Right, because it is, you know, it's addicting, it's addicting, it and it's destructive. I it mean, like, I, I always say it's always safe inside a book. Exactly. And it's, it's safe inside a book whether you're reading it or whether you're writing it, because you're, you're solving someone else's problems, you're living someone else's life, you're essentially being someone else. Yeah. And, you know, a well-written book, um, and it's interesting how my reading has really changed over the pandemic, because I have less patience for a not as good book, right? You know, it really has to draw me yeah. in, or my little squirrel brain just goes somewhere else. Yeah. But when you get a really good book, and your the walls fall away, um, and you're taken into that world of the story, yeah. it really shows you how important it is what we do. I mean, we decided yeah. to be writers in a time when it was kind of glorious to be writers, mm -hmm. and that you know that decision, that active decision to be involved in creativity and writing and literature doesn't, it becomes more important now instead of, instead of less important, don't you think? I agree a hundred percent. And speaking of which, let's start with the first good thing. Is there a book that you're reading right now that has really transported you in this way? Or is there something that you go back to again and again when you're looking for that universe that you want to escape into? I, three fast answers because it's three good things. Like first of all, your book Confessions on the Seven Forty Five, which I just happen to have right here, is you know talk about immersive. You know, it, your voice is so um, diabolical, and the character mm. development, even in chapter one, you know, you just lure us in and make us think one thing when it's really something else. I mean, it's just glorious. So we should talk about that. Good, 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 good. Thank you so uh, and much. I, Thank all you. the acclaim and all the buzz for this book. Thank you. I'm very it quite excited. amazing. The, yeah, you, sh you should be because you're really, um, you're really so good at what you do. And, and reading it as a reader is one thing. I'm drawn into the book, of course, um, and it's a terrific story. But Reading it as a writer, you know, we read books as writers, it's inevitable that we do. Yeah, and course. I can see the craft, you know, I can see what you're, you know, like, I can see what you're doing here. I, I can <laughs> see how you're making this work. So I can read it from a sheer enjoyment standpoint, and that's great. And then I, there's this sort of jealousy level, and, I'm, and, I, and I know what, I see what you're doing as a skilled writer, oh, okay. um, and how seamlessly you pull that off. So um, it's, you know, I, I completely add my voice to all the buzz Thank about you, this though. book. It's completely Thank great. Another really great book um, yeah. is And Now She's Gone by Rachel Housel Hall. I've been, this is on my, my to read list, like big yeah. time. I can't yeah, she, Rachel Housel Hall is really, um, she's really a cool woman and a, and a, and a authentically good writer. And I'm really interested, um, as you can tell from The First to Lie, about people who disappear and people who yeah. become someone else. Right. And, and what, and sort of, what is the right thing to do? Yeah. You know, if you're hired to do a thing or supposed to do a thing, and then you kind of begin to think, well, what if that, what if that job is not the thing that I should do? What if there's a greater good? Yeah. You know, what, do you do what's better for you? Or right. do you do what's better for the greater good? Or do you do what's better for someone else? You know, what are, I mean, we, we write fast paced, page turning, compelling thrillers that, you know, so I don't mean to be woo woo about theme, but, well, I mean, theme is, are about. theme is the heart and soul of, yeah. of, of every book. I mean, theme and, and character, you know, like the, those stories, those people that populate our books, I mean, that's what people really care about. We've yeah. talked about this before. You could have the best plot, you know, 
that anybody could conceive of, but if people don't care about yeah. the characters and they're not, you know, in those themes with you, then they're not turning the pages in the same way. It's yeah. not just about plot, of course. And then when you when you finish the book, you want more, you want the right. you know, you want the story to be gorgeously wrapped up. Right. But you also want to leave the you know, leave readers with a feeling of that they have changed, that they have thought of yeah. the world in a different way, that they see you know, life through some other brain and some other eyes and come out with an emotion um, yeah. or an understanding that they didn't have before without, exactly. you know, without the two of us beating it over the head, you know, beating theme over the head. It, it, yeah. emerges. Well, it's it should be organic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like, I mean, it's not like the individual parts of any story are exist separately from each other. Yeah. Everything is, is part of the mosaic of the, of the story. It doesn't, not, not any one piece is going to be, you know, it's not necessary to use any one piece to hit the reader over the head. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's, yeah, a mosaic, just like life. it's a mosaic. Exactly right. Exactly right. I mean, I read a wonderful interview with David McCullough once, the biographer, historian David McCullough, and he was asked, do you have a theme for each of your books? And he says, he said, yes, I do. And I write the see what the theme is and you know that is that's just so telling for me because you know as you're writing you know when I was writing the first to lie I say oh you know this is about family loyalty that that's what this is about it's about the price of betrayal right and that's what this is about and then that you know like a drop of iodine in clear water it just mm -hmm. sort of colors everything exactly exactly yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad. So Rachel's book is, is fantastic. And maybe Rachel, if you're watching, will you, will you come on for good things? <laughs> I, you know, I, I will call Rachel as soon as we're over. Oh, she, well, yeah, yeah. Important to be on. She's great and she's fun. And I'm so thrilled. If you haven't met her, you will absolutely I love haven't her. Met her. And that's, that's, the, that's the other reason why I'm doing this is because, you know, like I, have, for, I didn't realize like how you know, how much connection, new connections, or how many new connect connections we make every year when we're out on the road and when we're like at conferences and stuff. And so I, you know, I, I always think of myself as an extreme introvert and I am that, but I also kind of enjoy those connections and like that writer time. So that's another reason for, for this too, is to like not only just connect with my pals, but also to kind of reach out and say, hey, you want to just talk about books and hopefully. Which is great. I mean, the introvert thing, is that so interesting? If someone said to me, do you want to go to a party or do you want to stay home? I'd be, I'm home. I'm totally I'm home. Too. I'm jammies at home for sure. Yeah. And the, I, I'm, I've been a reporter for 43 years. Right. And people say, how can, you be a, how can you be a reporter and be an introvert? It's and different. being a reporter allows me, it gives me a role. You yeah, know, I can ask exactly. you a question as a reporter. I'm fine to do that. Yeah. Um, but just sort of chit chatting with a stranger at a cocktail party yeah. terrifies me. <laughs> it is terrifying. <laughs> well, speaking of your, your sort of your life as a reporter and how you were saying that, you know, it's difficult to sort of ration the news for yourself, um, you know, because that's been, you know, such a huge part of your life for 43 years. Um, is there anything that like sort of is not news on the screen that that's been sort of saving you, transporting you? Is it there like a favorite film or a great television show that you know you're like, okay, I can't watch another second of the news. Click, I'm going to be watching this for the next. Hour. Well, you know what there is, and I can tell you about this because my husband and I have discovered Borgen. And Borgen is a Danish show. Um, it's sort of the West Wing in Denmark. Oh, and it is great. B O R G E N. It's the okay. Danish Parliament. Great. And it is. It's. It's. it's it has four seasons. I think ten shows a season. We're about halfway through. About um, the a, a female prime minister of Denmark, but it is totally, as I said, the West Wing in Denmark. And we're, you know, Jonathan and I are now immersed in Danish parliamentary procedure <laughs> as a result of watching Borgen. And that's the other cool. thing that's cool about it, and this is sort of such a writer thing is that, so it's in Danish, but then it's dubbed in English, but it's also subtitled in English. But the, okay. but the dubbing, the dubbing in English is different. The words are different than the subtitles. And they're very different. I mean, they, oh. they're almost like watching two different stories because the subtleties um, and the specific word choice, if you just watched one or the other, it'd be fine. But watching both, there's a level of sort of sinisterness in the subtitles, and the subtitles are, titles are a little more racy than the actual dubbing. Wow. 
That's so really like, interesting. It's like watching two different shows. So it's yeah. great. I, Morgan is wonderful. Oh my gosh. I'm, we're, that's so going on my list. That is such an interesting thing that the dubbing is different than the, than the subtitles. It's fascinating because I know, I know, I think Jim Ziskin used to do dubbing, you know, the wonderful author, Jim, James Ziskin used yeah. to do dubbing for movies. And I bet we should call him and ask him about why, why this would happen, whether, you know, whether the dubbers and the, the dubbers and the, and the subtitle people don't talk to each other. Yeah. Um, and then somebody just, some, editor yeah, just marries the two of them without knowing I, I don't know I don't know I think that sounds like this sounds like such an interesting panel not just for you know maybe not just for even television but also like translations like book translations like sure. what you know like what you know what does a book translator look for and then how do they like try to stay true to what they're hearing and then how does or what they're reading and then how does their like own native language impact their understanding of the one that they're trying to translate and, you know when they I, I've had the, the translators of my books, you know, into Italian, in, into German, into Hungarian, yeah. into Russian, yeah. you know, to contact me and say, what do you mean? Exactly. By this? Yeah. Because the idioms are so complicated. Right. So or how does this place English. look? Cause like they can't envision the type of place you're talking about. And like, they want, you know, to have a conversation about even the setting with you so that they yeah. can orient, so they can orient themselves. It's, it's interesting. It's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and very layered and textured. So we have we have fun watching the story, and then we have fun comparing what people are saying with what's being typed. So yeah, that's it's never so cool. a dull moment. Yeah, we're actually watching right now on Netflix. We started watching Away with Hilary Swank. Have you heard oh, what of is that? It's about, it's about her. It's about um, this um, group of astronauts. Their vo their voyage to Mars. But it's also about um, Hillary Swank, who's the commander of the voyage, and uh, she has left her family behind. So it winds up being this super intense family drama, also, you know, super intense, like sort of space adventure type movie. And I'm film, I'm not film, um, television series. And it's just, it's absolutely <laughs> riveting. <laughs> Oh, that sounds great. That's, yeah. You know what that else is um, unbelievable. Have you seen Unbelievable? No, no. Oh my gosh. It's go, go, I was going to say, go watch it right now. <laughs> don't don't go know. right now because I can't <laughs> carry this off on my own. But um, Unbelievable is wonderful. It's the story of a woman who is not believed ah. and the two police detectives, women, who ah. are working on her case. I don't want to tell you anything okay. more than that, but it is, right. it is stunningly, stunningly good. Unbelievable. Ooh. Awesome. That's great. I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait for that. Yeah. And I find, you know, I, I mean, I definitely, since the pandemic, I feel like we're probably all watching more, you know, <laughs> television, movies and film and reading more and all that's good. And I think it's, you know, it's just it speaks to the way story nourishes us, you know, and how we're, you know, it, you know, like you say, we're always safe inside this, inside a book, we're safe inside a, a television show allows us to kind of escape for a little while. And for us here at my place, we're always cooking now too. That's another, another thing we're doing a lot more of. We're cooking all the time. Um, and, you know, we both always love to cook, Jeff and I, and my daughter, Ocean, she also loves to cook, although she really prefers it when we cook for her and then yeah. serve her. Why wouldn't she? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That sounds good to me. Take a come over. That would be great. I'd love to do that too. Yeah, I think I've made, I think I've made, not that anyone's counting, but I think that I've made 194 dinners in yeah. a row. That sounds so I mean, Seriously. And we send, you know, we bought gift certificates to restaurants. Yeah. But, you know, I'm old and I, you know, I think I'll send, I'll, I'll buy gift certificates and I'll use them when this is over. But I'll just stick with cooking at home. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. what? So, so, do you have some stuff that's kind of like you have some food that's your kind of go-to comfort food, or something that is just a go-to? Like, okay, I don't have any time. This is what we're doing. I know how to do this in my sleep, or just something that you're like, oh my god, we've had the worst day. We're gonna make this. Is there anything like that for you? 
Well, you know what's happened over the pandemic? The other thing that we did uh, that's food oriented is that for some reason I decided, you know, we, we've always had flower gardens, but for some reason I decided we need that we needed vegetable gardens because what if the whole yeah. world falls right. apart? You know, exactly. we're, we're going to need tomatoes, right? We're gonna, yeah. So we planted tomatoes and cucumbers and a lot of basil and parsley and those kinds of things. Um, and we are, we are ridiculously devoted to this, to this garden. It's, it's crazy. We go out every morning and Aww, do the cute great. check to see how the cucumbers that. are doing. Yeah. And Jonathan and I pick the little tiny cherry tomatoes together, the red ones and the yellow ones. And, it, you know, we, it, it's, it's kind of a beautiful, yeah. I, mean, I know I'm just such a city girl and it's ridiculous. So I, so all these things I'm saying about, oh, plants is, sounds so <laughs> disingenuous, but you know, nature and how it works and you know what plants are happy and then this abundance of gorgeous sun warmed tomatoes yeah. is just you know just transporting it's just really a different thing so we've i i have made so we've gotten hundreds maybe thousands hundreds of tomatoes hundreds of gorgeous tomatoes oh, so you know seared tomatoes with pasta and fresh basil or mm -hmm. you know caprese salad with tomatoes and basil and mozzarella and gorgeous balsamic vinaigrette um, all those kinds of, you know, shrimp, grilled shrimp, and, you know, all those kinds of things that yeah. um, you can make with um, fresh, fresh yes. yeah. vegetables yeah. Is, are, are completely great. When yes. it's winter, though, I'm going to be making turkey tetrazzini. Do you ever make turkey tetrazzini? I haven't ever made that. Uh, it's, I mean, it's crazy because the, in the recipe, it's first you get a turkey. You, know, you have to make a turkey. <laughs> so it's perfect for after Thanksgiving. Right, exactly. But you know, it's turkey, white wine, Parmesan cheese, mushrooms, bechamel oh, sauce, oh, put yeah. it all together with cheese on the top and it's burbly, crispy, chewy cheese on the top and this mm. wine, mushroom, bechamel soaked wow. turkey. It use, it's delicious. Wow, so I can so make it without a recipe now, but be, be, as I was practicing, it, the only bad thing besides first you get a turkey is it uses every pan in the kitchen. Yeah. And, and there's the mushroom saute pan. And right, you gotta the make the back of right. <laughs> and, the pan. and yeah, but it's really, it's really good. This is worth it. You know, I mean, that's the other thing too, like about just, you know, being in the kitchen all the time, you know, it's just, it's sometimes it's worth it to use every pan in, in the kitchen because I mean, what else, right? Like, and, and because we have the deal that I cook yeah. And Jonathan cleans up the kitchen. Okay, that's a good deal. That's so good. that is a good yeah. deal. <laughs> My deal with Jeff is that he cooks and he cleans up the kitchen. <laughs> oh, that's an even better deal. <laughs> so I'm gonna go, honey. <laughs> I'm gonna go renegotiate. I'm, I need to do that. I have to go renegotiate. Yep, yeah, it's time to go back to the table on that one for sure. <laughs> back to the table, exactly. <laughs> no, I know, I love the idea of Ocean being uh, having dinner brought to Ocean. Yeah, this well, is also a good, you know, she has I, negotiated a good deal. She has, she's really negotiated a pretty good deal for herself. And she, you know, the thing is that she's a really good cook, like she's got that like natural thing. Uh -huh. And, you know, but she's really just become accustomed to like Jeff and I basically just, you know, being her love slave. So we're well, working she's on a kid. <laughs> we're working and, on You know, she's lovable. So you might as well she give is. her she is. There's, a really, yeah. there's a really good cookbook that she might be, or you that might be interested in called the Blue Strawberry Cookbook mm. by a chef called Mark Haller. Oh. And it doesn't really have recipes. It just tells why things work. Oh, that's so, cool. you know, to make a pesto, you need a green thing and a garlic thing, right. and an oil thing and a cheese thing, but it can right. be anything, right? right? A roux is some sort of, you know, it's a thickener and a liquid and a, right. And so you, it allows you to make a delicious thing out of whatever you happen to have. It just shows um, you like, it's the chemistry of cooking. It's why yeah. things work. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I will, yeah. I will, I will definitely look into that. Cause that's, you know, something that, I mean, I think that, and also if you learn, if you learn to cook from cooks, you know, like my mom is an excellent cook. My grandmother is an amazing Italian cook. And so like, when you learn, you learn to cook in that way that like, it's not, it's an osmosis, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Like you're just there in the kitchen all the time growing up. 
And so they're just things that you know how to make that you don't even remember anybody ever teaching you how to make. And there's like an instinct about it, but like, you know, when you can sort of get into like the theory of cooking, like why things work together and why things happen. And, and then you realize that there's like this really strong connection between every like ethnic cuisine, right? Like every ethnic cuisine yeah. has like very similar ingredients and the things turned out to be like completely different thing in your mind, but they're actually like sort of the same, sort of the like same. empanadas and blinces and crepes exactly. and all exactly. those, you know, exactly. a flower thing with something in the middle. Every culture has that. Exactly, um, exactly, right? And so that's like such an interesting like thing to to think about in terms of like you know, how small how the small world how small yeah. the world actually yeah. is, yeah. you know, in that way. Um, well, Hank, you know, it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to hang out with you as always and talk to you. And um, I just love, I love hearing you talk about anything, anything. Well, thank you. Especially I mean, I, I want to say that it was so great when Hannah Mary McKinnon read from <gasps> um, Confessions on the 745 on oh First Oh my God. That was what was that like to hear her? It's an, it's amazing. And actually, she also did the Stranger Inside a few weeks ago, right? So, it is it's always amazing to hear somebody else read your work to imbue your words with their like sort of reader's mind. Mm -hmm. So that was really fascinating. She does just such an amazing job, and it's I don't think it's not just because she's British, but it does make me feel that I wish the voice in my own head was also British. <laughs> You know, she, well, we, you know, we, we divide the books on first chapter five yeah. every Tuesday and Thursday at 1230. Yeah. We divide the books, but we make sure that she, the Hannah gets all the books that are written by Brits. Yeah. Because it's only fair to have that British accent, you know, be so authentic. But, but, it, but there is some authority to a British accent. There is. I, like, I think I need that voice in my head. I think I would be, you know, I think, I, I don't know how I can do that. You know, I spent a lot of time in the UK as a kid. Um, oh. my, I was there for, for a long time, um, as a young person, my, my, my dad worked over there. So oh. I feel like I'm, I was almost British. Like it just would have been one or two turns of fate and I could, I maybe still be there, you know, like yeah. maybe, maybe you, you should, know. maybe you should write a British character. I, you know, yeah, I, could, I might, I might that. embody, embody that person. <laughs> get in slip into that skin yeah so i'll think about that but it was truly wonderful and first chapter fun if you guys haven't tuned in for it is an absolutely super cool thing that hank and, and hannah do um where they i think it's every tuesday and thursday at 12 30 um eastern time they uh they read from one new book um of their choosing and it's just so fun to hear them read aloud it's like as if somebody was reading you a bedtime story in, in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just have lunch with Hank and Hannah, hear one chapter. Right. Yeah, one chapter, and it's always a teaser, you know, and you're always like, <gasps> you know, you're always ready, you know, ready for the next chapter. And it's just a great way to, you know, sample what's out there and, you know, connect with authors and also connect with other readers because it's a very lively chat going on as well, like in the in the comments and stuff. So it's always, it was, you know, my mine on, on the, this past week was really, really fun. I enjoyed it so much. Everyone was so thrilled that you came and chat. Oh, you yeah. chatted and commented and hung out. It was really, it's always really fun. The authors often come. So yeah, it was right, very it was fun. Really lively community. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. So thank you for doing that. And um, just to remind everyone, the first to lie. Thank you. One of my favorite books of the year. Um, Hank is one of my favorite writers. And I think you can find out everything that you want to know about Hank at hankphilippyryan.com and, and Instagram and Facebook, you know, and, I'm sadly there way too much. Yes. <laughs> you can't, you can't miss us. We're, <laughs> we're <That's>... out there. <laughs> we're out there. So thank you for joining me for three good things. Hank, thanks for being here. You're the best and we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you.